Hi folks, it's a concerned Dr. Miskoff. It's about 8 p.m. on May 17th, 2020. Hope everybody's doing well and staying safe and COVID-free. Uh, continue to fight the battle inpatient on COVID-19. And, you know, it's good to see that the numbers have trended down, but there's still a sort of stuck steady flow now uh, at a lower plateau. Um, uh, so the numbers have trended down, but we're still seeing several admissions per day with COVID-19. There have been some days with none. Uh, which is good to report. Uh, we are uh, updating on remdesivir. I uh, did get uh, about 28 patients worth. Initially, uh, this was all donated from Gilead, again, distributed by the state. Uh, so it was a state decision on which hospitals would get, um, you know, uh, initial remdesivir uh, and what quantity, I believe, and don't quote me on this, but based off of the last week or two of uh, numbers that were coming into hospitals that were reported. So the higher the volume, apparently, the more doses were given. So able to give that to patients who are labeled as severe. And as previous vlogs uh, had talked about, um, those would be patients with pulse oximetries of 94% or less than 94%. Uh, percent. Um, and then, of course, needing supplemental oxygen at that point, which pretty much everybody would get. Uh, you know, we usually put oxygen on patients, even if their pulse ox is above that uh, for supplement, because you never know if they're coming in with a pulmonary process, if they're going to decline. Um, uh, so, uh, and patients, you know, who basically have infiltrates, uh, most of these patients do when they require oxygen. Uh, if you get x-rays, you'll see, you know, 70, 80% of them at least uh, with bilateral infiltrates, uh, some of them milder, some of them more severe. Seems like you could almost pick off the ones that are going to need higher level of, you know, uh, the entire regimen that you have available. Um, the patients with the bilateral infiltrates, you know, on more than just a liter or two of oxygen. Um, with these fevers that are coming and going, uh, seem to be the ones that we're hitting uh, pretty hard. And we're hitting patients uh, hard with plasma up front. Uh, we do have a substantial supply of that, which has been utilized recently uh, in pretty much all types of patients coming in, different ages, uh, even older patients who are less functional uh, at the liberty with um, the quantity that came in, thanks to those who had donated in the communities uh, uh, for um, uh, giving a, a wide array of a patient presentations, uh, convalescent plasma. We've discussed that before. Uh, but remdesivir is here. It did come uh, before June, uh, as Gilead had promised. And now again, 28 patient doses are enough to treat 28 patients. And this is going to be a five-day regimen. Uh, but several patients have already been trialed uh, or are being trialed and started on that. And so far, so good. Um, I did want to talk uh, tonight a little bit about testing again as well. Um, uh, as we know, that continues to evolve. Uh, there are many different FDA-approved tests now for COVID-19, whether they be nasal swabs, sputum, or spit uh, testing, which is less invasive, of course, um, than the swab test, uh, whether it be antigen, RNA, or DNA-based uh, testing, or, and then, the, of course, the antibody testing. Uh, uh, a lot has evolved there, and it'll be interesting to see how, um, you know, as uh, society and the economy reopens, um, uh, you know, how those are utilized and to what quantity, right? Um, so now patients getting admitted inpatient, everybody's getting tested as of a few days ago, uh, meaning that if you get admitted, it doesn't matter if you came in with chest pain or uh, suspicion of COVID, uh, you're going to get a swab and hopefully we'll identify patients earlier um, that way. And again, outpatient, we'll see what happens with recent FDA approval of home testing. Uh, of course, that still has to be sent out and there's a few day lag time there. Uh, it'd be great if we had a uh, point of care five minute test at home uh, where you got the answer at home. And if they can pull that off, then I could see digital uh, utilization technology where people could test at home, uh, scan it, uh, go out, and then, of course, be scanned at events. Um, that would be something pretty phenomenal. Again, we understand that there are false uh, positives, negatives of these testing. It's not perfect. Uh, we're comparing this to nothing at all. Um, so, uh, did want to update on testing. Uh, another uh, topic of conversation, really the main topic tonight, will be on THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, uh, or marijuana, if you will, uh, the more lay term, of course. And, uh, you know, there is a recent press on CBDs, THC. Uh, we know there's lots of research um, uh, at this point on uh, anti inflammation and CBDs. Uh, they're being utilized in uh, you know, every state right now in the United States, of course, Canada, uh, having our even recreational federal legalization there, uh, more, a lot of research happening in Canada and, and even uh, overseas, uh, Israel looking at this as well. 
Uh, but, you know, those who are advocates of CBDs and THC uh, uh, definitely advocate that it has uh, anti-inflammatory, uh, a broad range of uh, ailments that they uh, state and have been studied, in, in fact, um, anything from rheumatoid uh, uh, arthritis um, to cancer, as I said, um, different strains of cannabis, whether, uh, you know, sativa, cannabis sativa is thought to have a very high concentrate uh, of CBDs or cannabino uh, cannabinoids, um, uh, so that may in fact have the most anti-inflammation or at least be up there. Uh, the concept is also is that it may downregulate or, or decrease gene expression, and we now know that there are uh, at least two proteins involved with COVID-19 and entrance into the body. The one that's gotten the most uh, discussion is the ACE2 receptor. Um, and then there's another one uh, called the T, like Tom, M, like Mary, P, like Paul, R, S, like Sam, S, like Sam, 2, the number 2. So uh, T, M, P, R, S, S, 2, and again, ACE2. Uh, we spoke, uh, I think, probably back on uh, the earliest vlogs about the ACE2 re uh, receptor and how it's thought that the virus basically connects to that. And that's how it gets sucked into the respiratory cells and uh, renal cells, muscular cells, potentially cardiac cells. Um, so that uh, down, uh, down regulating these ACE2 receptors and TMPs uh, may, in fact, uh, uh, reduce um, the um, severity of COVID-19 uh, or even potentially the transmission. So this could be important. All kind of started with uh, the conversations of early Chinese and Italian data. Uh, those with underlying lung disease seem to correlate with higher admission rates or hospitalization uh, in regards to COVID-19. Um, initially, uh, I think I even blogged early that, you know, risk and potential risk, the theories of smoking tobacco or uh, marijuana, uh, of course, the obvious risk of sharing these products with others that may be infected is, is an obvious risk. But, you know, did, did it in fact, you know, reduce immunity or um, increase transmission or susceptibility? It's still to be determined, but now there's some data coming out in vitro from Canada at the University of Lethbridge in Alberta, Canada. And this is under the, uh, you know, a study under the Health Canadian Research License, uh, where at least, again, another in vitro study, so not in humans, not in vivo, but if, if you will, in culture or test tube, showing that it can, in fact, decrease these ACE2 and TMPRSS2 uh, receptors. Um, so if you can reduce these receptor in, in vitro, does that translate into the human? You know, you listen, you can take uh, COVID-19 in a culture and put, you know, not to joke, but bleach your Lysol and it's going to kill it. That doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to work in the human. Uh, of course, uh, marijuana and THC would be considered safe, especially compared to, to bleach uh, uh, or some sort of toxic substance. substance. Um, uh, this was in the journal reprints. Uh, certain uh, marijuana strains being tested. Again, the theory of it may be potentially reducing uh, spread or severity. Uh, the concentrations of tetrahydrocannabinol or THC to CBD, uh, these cannabidiols, uh, ratio of 1 to 21 or 1 to 3, so there was quite a variability, um, uh, was uh, the ones that were most effective, again, in vitro. So again, the 1 to 21 ratio and the 1 to 3. So it seems like, a, again, a broad range there, suggesting that maybe there's something else involved. Maybe terpenes, uh, spoke on terpenes in the past. Uh, these are what give the flavor or aroma to the marijuana and other plants as well, and that they're supposed to interact sort of uh, in a symbiotic or uh, potentially complementary way with the CBDs. Uh, that is the theory. Again, cannabis sativa thinking to have maybe some of the higher concentration uh, and then how do you use this? Again, you know, as a pulmonologist, it's hard to be an advocate of the, you know, uh, of smoking uh, or inhalation, especially if there's underlying lung disease, uh, but maybe a mouthwash or uh, some sort of other uh, uh, way of giving it, you know, uh, orally um, uh, may be the way to go uh, if, in fact, it is found in human studies to work. Uh, this may uh, not have a role necessarily in inpatients or the sicker patients, but maybe in an outpatient preventative way uh, I could see it. And again, uh, there's no studies that are out in humans to, to prove these theories are only theories at this point. Probably not a cure. Uh, it could be an adjunct or a complement. It needs to be studied more in humans. Um, and again, it may not just be the THCs and the CBDs or maybe terpenes or other things that are involved. But if ACE2 really is and found to be the gateway, recent reports of adults 
um, older you are, uh, male, hypertensive, diabetics, potentially having more of these ACE2 receptors, and maybe that's one of the keys uh, to why that, that's a subset that seems to be you know, sicker or at risk of getting sicker, although again, uh, nobody immune theory where you could get a, uh, well now we're seeing, uh, unfortunately, even though very low percentages of children uh, with a, a strange variant of COVID-19, a delayed effect has been reported recently uh, in a blog I did and of course in the press, uh, but also in a 20 year old all the way up to, you know, the, the, the 100 year old. Um, so everybody, uh, you know, that's it uh, right now on the THC CBD story. Uh, Israel is also looking at these terpenes uh, thought to maybe have antiviral. Uh, so that testing is already underway. Um, so Canada, Israel, and I imagine we'll see some stuff uh, start popping up in the U.S. if uh, it's not already out there. Please stay well. We'll see you again soon. Um, have a great night.